Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have a pianist with me, David Korovar. Welcome. It's really great to be here, Tigran. Before we got on and we started recording, you were saying how you've been navigating through Zoom and helping students, you know, through this this time, this um, process of remote teaching. Uh, tell me a little bit about your experience since you're a university professor. How, how does it feel? How is it different, positive and negatives of working in this environment? Yeah. So um, University of Colorado, along with most schools, went fully remote last spring um, quite abruptly, right around the time of our spring break. And we had to, the, the faculty had to learn very quickly. The, studi- the students had to learn very quickly. We we're all desperately looking at online videos about how to use Zoom better and all of this sort of stuff. It was a, it was a quite a, quite a moment for us. Um, what's been interesting to me is actually how, how much you can manage to teach um, applied music, as we call it, private lessons in this kind of a situation. Um, it certainly is not the same as teaching in person. Mm. And we were teaching in person this uh, fall semester until um, a week and a half ago. And we are ending, I I believe we're approaching the end of a two week period of remote teaching. And I I mean, I can't, I don't want to say it because I don't want to jinx it. So hopefully we're going back soon. Um, But in the meantime, it's actually amazing how much you can get done. Mm -hmm. Um, And it makes you listen differently. You know, as a teacher and as a student, the students are left, you know, if I have a lot of concern with sound production, with the quality of sound, well, it be, it's, a, it's a different art judging that over Zoom. Mm-hmm. It does depend on the student's individual setup, what, uh, you know, their mic setup, their sound setup. But, you know, we've got it, so most of them are okay. But still, hearing them in person, you are dealing with a whole different level of subtlety. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so that's been interesting. On the other hand, dealing with broader musical issues is still very possible in many cases. Um, and I'm actually surprised at how many kind of sound production technical issues I can address over Zoom. It's much more, much more than I ever expected. And, you know, I think the big negative is, the, is that it is mentally much harder for both sides. And I think for the students, it's especially been a real challenge to lose that direct connection. Uh, that we have in our one-on-one one-on-one lessons. Yeah, uh, jumping a little bit to a different uh, topic is you are a very busy performer. You have recorded so many albums, and on top of that, you're a professor. I mean, it's it's it seems like something that, and I, I don't even know. You probably have other passions and hobbies and family and friends. How do you manage? You know, that's one thing that I've been asking musicians. How do you manage your time? How do you balance your time? How do you do all of this, especially for someone like you with such a busy schedule? Well, of course, it, you're asking me this question right now in a moment when live performance is not a thing. Yeah. yeah right? At least not in the U.S. And uh, in fact, I just gave I, my, with my colleague, uh, Charles Weatherby, wonderful violinist, we just did uh, what was my first live performance since uh, things shut down. And this was a, a, you know, an outdoor performance in somebody's yard. I was playing on an electric keyboard, which is not my usual instrument. Um, and it was remarkably satisfying because we, you know, we miss this. We, we thrive on it. You understand you're a performer. It's, it's very hard to not have that part of our lives active. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been, you know, that's been an interesting ride. You're asking me about how I, how I deal with this, this balance. And I, for many, many years, up until things shut down, I somehow or another did manage to do it. Um, and thrived i I suppose have always thrived on perhaps having too much to do that always there's the next project is always ready to go you know and i I guess one of the things i'm learning from this period is that that's not always the best possible thing which of course we know that right Mm -hmm. but to actually live it to be in a position where you know all of a sudden those performances you were expecting aren't happening those things you've been practicing for aren't happening. And 
um, for me, what I ended up doing was creating a big project for myself, which was um, doing videos at home on my out of tune piano, because I couldn't get a piano tuner, uh, of all of the Beethoven sonatas. And then I, you know, I ran out of Beethoven piano sonata, I, I ran out of the sonatas, so I started doing variations and bagatelles and things like that. Um, and that was good, and it occupied me very well, and I think it was also artistically and creatively a, a, a very satisfying project. Um, and apparently, you know, the three or four people who look at YouTube videos enjoyed it too, so that was a good thing. Uh, it's still up there, so it's still getting, still getting views, but um, it's, there's so many of us doing this right now too, and I, I think it's overwhelming in a way because there's so much content being generated, um, you know, even more than usual, and especially for classical performers, this has been a moment when everybody is suddenly discovering the the joy, I'll put that in scare quotes, of, um, of this kind of, uh, you know, self-generated, self-generated creativity mm -hmm. um, for an audience unknown. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very interesting experience um, doing this. Uh, I've been very fortunate in that my, I have one wonderful colleague, again, Charles Weatherby, who's this fabulous violinist, and he and I have done a series of recitals over the last uh, few months, going back to the early, early part of the summer, where we felt comfortable playing together in the same room again. And um, what we've ended up doing is exploring all kinds of repertoire rather unusual repertoire, much of which we hadn't played before. Um, we, just, we just recorded for uh, release um, a week from Friday, actually, a, a wonderful program of uh, folk-inspired music. Um, we did the uh, Dohnani's arrangement of three of his pieces from the Ruralia Hungarica, which is a piano set. Uh, but he did a wonderful arrangement for violin, which is so different from the piano originals that I've played that I actually had to really relearn the piece. We did the uh, third sonata of George Onescu, which is an absolute masterpiece based on his extremely sort of detailed notation of Romanian gypsy violin style. And this is a stunning work. And his, uh, you know, he's, of course, comes out of this tradition. He studied with Faure. He was friends with Ravel. The, the piece is, is immaculately constructed with perfect forms. And yet the whole atmosphere he evokes is this, this wild um, gypsy rhapsody. Wow. Uh, it's a really stunning, a kind of tour de force compositionally. And then, of course, both the piano, he was a, a virtuoso on both piano and violin, and it comes through in the writing. He's extraordinarily demanding of both players. Everything is possible, but he asks a lot all the time. Um, it was a great adventure learning this piece. Um, and we did, uh, we did a wonderful piece by uh, the um, Peruvian-American composer, uh, Gabriela Lina Frank, for violin and piano. Uh, it's a, Sueños de, de Chambi, which is uh, based on uh, a photographer's work uh, among uh, people in the Andes. Wow. And uh, the whole, she evokes all these amazing folk instrument colors using the piano and the violin and using these rather extraordinary techniques. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, creative use of, of the instruments as well. I mean, there's nothing inside the piano or anything. She doesn't go, everything is done on the keyboard. And yet she manages to create these colors that really evoke these, these uh, sounds of the, wow. the Peruvian folk music. Wow. Um, so anyway, that was that's that was our latest adventure in in doing these kind of big violin and piano programs, and wonderful opportunity to learn and, and at least virtually perform uh, some great repertoire. Wow, I've been asking this question to my last couple of guests: Is there a composer, a musician from the past that's no longer around that you would have loved the opportunity to meet? to collaborate with maybe, or just to have a coffee and talk about music or life? Is there a composer or, or a musician that comes to mind first? If for some reason, the first name that popped into my head right now is Ravel, but I'm not sure that would be my answer on another day. And I'm not sure why that was the first name that popped into my head, Tigran. <laughs> so interesting. Why, why that? I mean, and I've, I've spent so many years around Ravel's music, and I, I studied with someone who actually had known Ravel and done some, some playing for him. But it's actually that's sort of an interesting answer, and it's one that surprises me. 
you know, the obvious, the obvious answer is people like Beethoven. Of course, mm-hmm. if you were in the room with Beethoven, you would be so intimidated, right? You'd be tongue-tied. You wouldn't be able to say anything. So you've got to pick a composer you could actually talk to <laughs> without just being kind of a, a, a puddle, right? <laughs> so who's, who's not so intimidated? <laughs> Maybe, uh, that's tough. Um, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, would have loved, I would have loved to have a chance to meet Brahms. Um, can name all my favorite composers. I'd love to talk about piano technique with Chopin. I'm fascinated by his, by his approach to the instrument, by his, the, the information we have on his pedagogy, both from the little bit he wrote himself and also from reports from his students. Um, I feel like there's a great, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for, for that. Um, one of my one of my feelings as a pianist is is to be able to do what Roy Howitt describes getting under the skin of the composer and of course pianists are lucky because we play music written by great pianists mm-hmm. those great pianists happen to be you know the great composers of the canon yeah yeah and they all have an idiosyncratic way of writing for the instrument that reflects how they approached it mm-hmm. you can you can just from the notes themselves often figure out how they used their hands on the keyboard and i think that's a fascinating kind of way of being connected with a composer hmm. you can imagine you know that brahms when he wanted to change positions in his left hand would go from the thumb to the fifth finger when he was going up and you can figure this out very easily because it's the only practical way to solve all kinds of technical problems in his music um and that's an easy example but i'm totally fascinated by that why yeah. you know being able to kind of as part of understanding any composer's style when I play their music is to try to actually figure out how they put their hands on the piano, yeah. what kinds of fingerings they chose to use just from the, the way they're arranging the, the notes in their pieces. Yeah. And you've, you've uh, recorded uh, Bach and Chopin and uh, Brahms and also many composers that uh, even some musicians might look at and say, I don't even know who that is. Uh, right. Where are those? You, you've, you've, you've done that a lot. What, what's your approach to actually putting a recording together? You know, do you have a, a vision for it or do you just program things? Do you record things that are, you're working on currently or is there an actual kind of unifying theme uh, for, for some of your albums? Well, so it, that, right, that, that's a sort of case by case question. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you mentioned Bach, well, I've recorded a lot of Bach mm-hmm. and it's actually, it, it's interesting because if you had asked me at the age of 20 about that, I would say, well, I don't really have any particular attachment to this music. I don't really get it, actually. Mm-hmm. And there was a point in my, it would have been just around the time I turned 30, I think, mm-hmm. where I suddenly realized that I really had to delve into this. And I made it my business to learn all the 48 preludes and fugues in the well timbre clavier and to record them. And that was because, A, I believed I could do it in a way that was of interest to people. And happily, it seems to have been interest, of interest to some people. So that's good. Um, but it was also for me a part of my own curiosity and self-education. And that's, that sounds very selfish, but as, as somebody who teaches and performs music, here's one of these sort of monuments, you know, it's like the pyramids of Egypt. And I didn't know my way around it. Um, so what better way to get to know your way around it, right? Um, and now I do know my way around it. And of course, my ideas about how to play it have changed in the, you know, almost 30 years since I recorded it. So it's an interesting thing to see to see that evolution too. Time for a um, new recording. Well, yeah, if I could afford it, that would be something. No, I've, I've certainly considered it. Um, the other, my other Bach projects, I, I went ahead and it, the Goldberg variations were actually at the request of a, a colleague of mine who had been building websites with my live, but he actually put together the project for me to record the Goldberg variations. And then the other big Bach work I recorded, of course, was the, part- the six partitas. And in that case, I really wanted to make a kind of statement um, and I remember working with my, my wonderful producer, Richard Price, and saying to him, you know, Richard, what I really want to do here is I really want to do this the way you would do a jazz album, where basically you just record, you just record these takes, you know, and there's not, 
a sense of, you, you basically just pick the best one rather than try to do this thing we do in classical recordings where we, you know, we do the, we do kind of a bass take and then we sit there and we cut and paste the, the wrong notes and do this, this kind of crazy fussiness. And for the partitas, I really felt that the music demanded, and I feel the same way about the Goldbergs, actually, the music demands a kind of sense of improvisation and a sense of spontaneity. Um, I do a lot of embellishing. I feel like um, each time I play it, those embellishments are not going to be exactly the same. There's, there are, there's a whole variety of possible embellishments, and in this sense, it is like improvisation. Um, the way a certain phrase might get paced, things like that are constantly changing. It's just that, I, that whole idea that, you know, in classical music, we tend to, in recording, get into this idea that we have to do something, we, we have to have a plan, we have to do something according to some preconception. Um, and I, I really loved that process of, of saying, no, we're not, we're not, we're not, that the plan is to record this music, but it's, but I actually don't know as we're starting this project exactly what the result is going to be. And in a way that's, that's maybe the recording of all the recordings I've ever done that I'm proudest of. And I think it's the one that if I listen to it now, and I, I don't listen to my own recordings that often, but if I stick it on because I'm pulling it out for demonstrations in my piano literature class, which I did recently, it's like, I can listen to the performances and be engaged mm -hmm. because I actually don't know what's coming next. Yeah. I mean, there's something very nice about that. It's yeah. not, it's not so predictable. Wow. Are there composers that you've recorded that you wish just had more attention? People recognize them more. Uh, I'm sure there are a few. I'm thinking of a few that you've done, but. Uh, well, of course, my, what I had a, a recent project, um, of piano music by this Italian composer, Luigi Paracchio. And this I, have, one, I got that album. I just got ah, the album. Okay. It's great. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, you know, this is one of these things where you kind of, you kind of stumble on something. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled on the music quite a number of years ago in the University of Colorado Library. Um, I was uh, doing research on a collection of piano music we have that, that was in the library of the, pianist Ricardo Vignes. Mm. And Vignes, who was a very important pianist in early 20th century Paris, he was the kind of the pianistic muse for both Ravel and Debussy when they wrote most of their important piano works. Um, and amongst the many scores that he had, because every composer wanted him to play their works, um, was this this collection of nove poemetti, nine little poems by this composer, Luigi Paracchio. And I, as part of my project, I was basically going through all the scores we had, which was I think some 800 scores from his library and basically evaluating them for whether they were worthwhile or not. And, and you have to understand this is a collection in which you and I have not heard of 90% of the composers in there. Mm -hmm. I'm not exaggerating. Um, it's an amazing bunch. Um, and there's good reason why we haven't heard of 75% of those. But then there's also the stuff that's good. And these parochial pieces, when I pulled them out and started looking at them, just drew me right in. Uh, it took me a lot of years to get around to actually getting this this project off the ground, though. It was uh, having some research funds available and um, having a chance to figure out what to fill out the recording with, because these Nove Poemetti wasn't full wasn't a full CD. I don't know if CDs are relevant anymore in this world, but we're still we're still looking at a CD in the classical world as being something that includes between 60 and 75 minutes of music because otherwise people feel like they're not getting their money's worth, right? Um, so I found another wonderful work by Paracchio, one which was already somewhat known and which I believe there was an LP recording of it by some Italian pianist at some point in the, in the 70s, but I can't locate a copy of this. Um, it's a set of 25 preludes which are absolutely marvelous kind of neoclassic pieces. So the, the Nove Poemetti, the pieces I discovered at the University of Colorado library are in a um, very much an impressionistic style. You can really see that he loved the music of Debussy. 
Um, he went, he spent some time in Paris. He met Debussy, he met Ravel, he met other composers there. Um, and he did meet Ricardo Vignes at that point, which is why one of these pieces is dedicated to Vignes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they're wonderful because they are not Ravel or Debussy. They are definitely Paracchio. He has his own voice. Um, yeah, and I actually, I'm with COVID, COVID hit and put on hold one of a project I have actually to uh, bring to light some more of his music. I traveled to Turin, which was where he spent his entire career, and um, went into their library there where they have his papers and found a number of really interesting works, uh, chamber works especially, um, and there's a piano quintet in particular that I would like to get performed and recorded. So that's high on my agenda. Um, for, for a follow-on project to Mr. Paracchio. And here is a composer who outside of Turin, and outside of a very few people in Turin at this point, is not known. Yeah. Um, a generation ago, he was known because he had a lot of students, and those students knew of him. Mm. Um, but now those people are disappearing. Yeah. Um, so there are, not a lot, there are not a lot of people left who are really aware of Paracchio's legacy. Yeah. Yeah, I have met some of them now. So I, I didn't know till I heard the recording by you. So uh, thanks right. for introducing me. So now I know. Uh, jumping a little bit uh, backwards in your career and going to Earl Wilde. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about him and your relationship with him. Uh, and I, I first found out about him just a couple of weeks ago. I have a radio show and I played uh, his music and I realized it said Earl Wilde and I really didn't know, you know, uh, about him. So uh, that's the way I found out, even though he is a big name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's interesting how, how generations proceed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and how reputations uh, can be. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So I met Earl because my first piano teacher in San Diego, California, mm -hmm. um, knew a woman who was taking lessons from him. And as a result, my teacher, Sherman Store, decided he was going to introduce a couple of his better students to Earl Wilde because Earl Wilde seemed to want to teach some people. He was living in Palm Springs. He was kind of in a, in a, a semi-retirement because he was having heart issues and had left New York City to be in a quieter place and had reduced his concert activity quite considerably for, for a short period. Um, and so I was lucky enough to be introduced to him, to play for him, and he saw some talent there. I don't think I played terribly well. I was, uh, I was always able to conceptualize music well beyond my ability to play it. Mm. And that's not necessarily a good thing when you're 12 or 13 years old. In any case, <laughs> he took me on as a student at that age. And I used to go up every two weeks and spend an afternoon with him. Mm. Um, and he, we did the lessons either at the concert hall in the Palm Springs Desert Museum and then, or um, at his home. He didn't always get along with people in the long term. And I think eventually the people at the Desert Museum didn't want to have anything to do with Earl anymore. And uh, so we ended up doing the lessons at his home. Um, and uh, also made a lifelong connection with his, his uh, partner of the last 30 years of his life, Michael Davis, who still mm -hmm. who's, lives in Palm Springs now. Um, and I, Earl moved back to New York uh, as I was about to finish high school and I went and followed him there. He had joined the faculty at Juilliard. I went to work with him at Juilliard uh, for my bachelor's and master's degrees. Um, and Earl was not always the easiest person to get along with. So while he was a kind of father figure, we also had our stresses and I didn't actually have a close relationship with him for about probably 15 years or so. And then came back into his orbit. Um, we, we both managed to sort of make a rapprochement, I think. And towards the end of his life, um, he had a record label called Ivory Classics and I did several recording projects for him. Um, 
and recorded with him in the in the production booth, which was a very strange and intimidating experience, as you might imagine, to have your to have your teacher, but not merely your teacher, but this guy who you'd always just just kind of idolized in a sense as a pianist. I mean, he, this, he was one of the great pianists of the 20th century. Yeah. He's included in Tom Deacon's set of great pianists of the 20th century. And, you know, for good reason, the, the formidable ability to play the most difficult music um, and, a, and a, a rather extraordinary ear for sound and color. Uh, you know, it is, there were things he could do that were really spectacular in that department. Um, you know, so I owed a lot to him, but I also was still, even at that point, after having known him for, yeah, 30 years, I was still intimidated. <laughs> well, uh, you, you did all your degrees, bachelor's, master's, and doctor's at Juilliard, right? Correct. I, I, I think I know only one other person that's done that. One of them is my colleague, Jennifer Hagee, who I, who's, who's now at the University of Colorado. Mm-hmm. Two doors, that, two doors down from me. Actually, she's next door to me now in our new yeah. ring. The other person I know is actually a pianist as well, pianist conductor, Jan Robertson. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, uh, and so uh, that's, that's the only other person I know that's done that. Um, um, I can name one more, Lowell Lieberman. Oh, wow. And you've recorded some, some music by Lieberman, right? Yeah, well, Lowell and I, Lowell and I met uh, as freshmen at Juilliard. Uh-huh, okay. So... We've known each other since 1979, I guess, or wow. something like that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I've recorded all of his solo piano music today. Wow. Um, it's three CDs worth, wow. as well as some chamber music. And uh, another thing that surprised me when reading about you about a week ago, when I find out who my next guest is, I'm in a routine. I just read about them right away about a week before, and then I just kind of go over my, some of my notes just right before. I read that you're also a composer and you studied with a great composer who I've actually conducted music by. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that was actually because of Lowell, because I was, I was kind of, I was kind of playing at composing. I mean, I was, I was writing pieces in high school, um, never had any training, hmm. it was just kind of, you know, stuff I heard and putting things together and writing notes down. Um, and Lowell actually suggested that Lowell was working with David Diamond at that point, And he suggested I go and, and um, meet with him. And David Diamond took me on as a student for what wow. Juilliard referred to as a secondary major, which was a very nice arrangement. I basically, I didn't have to do composition juries or mm-hmm. anything, but I, I got, um, got a weekly lesson with Mr. Diamond. Um, I was a full participant in composers forums. I could have my pieces compo- uh, played on composer concerts at the school and things like that, which was great. Um, that said, I really have let my compositional side kind of drop off since you know the, the early 90s. So mm-hmm. it's been a long time since I've actually created new work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to say I've been, I've been well enough occupied that I don't feel... Uh, I don't feel ber- I don't feel like I'm missing that as much as I might have expected to because it, it was very important to me. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we do these things out of passion, not not for any other reason. Yeah. Uh, I certainly never made a penny off my composing, so it was always it was always a labor of love. Um, and I do have some old pieces that I'll occasionally play, um, so they do get they do get done every now and then. But I I've never really promoted that that part of me. I think it's a very important part of who I am. And I think it gives me an understanding of music from the inside mm. that I wouldn't have otherwise. Mm. I mean, that I, I, I do feel that I have a, that, that one of the things that's very important to me is to have a sense of how the process of creating the music that I'm working on might have happened. Mm. Um, you know, how does, how does somebody put together ideas into this final form? Yeah. Any, any stories I always like to know, and I know you can't say much. I know that when you work with some of these great artists, I've, I've had Ransom Wilson on and he's worked with Jean Pierre on Paul and I've had so many artists and I don't like to push certain things, but if there's something that you're willing to share that you think would 
work in this format to share with the world. Is there anything about David Diamond that you're willing to share a funny story as some kind of an incident? I don't know. Di Diamond, Diamond was, a, was a crazy guy. He was very <laughs> difficult. He had, you know, there were people who really, he really, really, really hated. And he mm -hmm. was, um, he was, and I, I hate to, to say this, he was a, a very bitter and conflicted individual. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say, I don't think you'll find anybody who disagrees with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that he sabotaged himself to a great extent. You said you've conducted some of his work, so you know he wrote some good music. Mm -hmm. um, he also wrote some bad music. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure he could discern the difference sometimes. You know, I think his own sort of ability to be self-critical was problematic. And you know, it's a little sad because the stories I remember were him complaining bitterly about the success of his good friends, Leonard Bernstein and Aaron Copeland. Mm -hmm. He always felt like he was as good as they were. And they were kind of a triumvirate at a certain point. They hung out together. They did stuff together. And Diamond always felt like the one who'd been left behind, I think. Yeah. It was a tough place to be. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's maybe not the nicest way to remember somebody. I learned from him really one, one really essential thing about uh, the compositional process, which was this idea that you take ideas and work with them, which sounds really obvious, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a kind of a key to, to get, um, you know, and there are those who worked with him who, who claimed that he never really could look at or understand the work that students brought in. And I would say that's not entirely true. I think that he really, at least with me, he did look at what I had brought in. He did listen to what I brought in. Um, I would say that some of his critiques were um, a little bit canned. In other words, he had certain things he would say. He didn't really think octaves were a good idea, for example. Um, anybody who writes music that involves instruments knows that octaves are a very good idea um, because of resonance and things like that. Um, but he had these kind of set pieces because, of course, if you use octaves, your music doesn't sound modern enough. And um, so, you know, there, there was that aspect of it, but there was also the aspect of somebody who had worked with Nadia Boulanger, somebody who did understand that very rational approach to dealing with the material you get from inspiration. And I think that's something that's really important because if music doesn't have that, it's hard to, it's hard to make it coherent. It's hard to make it so other people can understand what it is you're doing. It can't just be pure emotion. It can't just be this, you know, this, this dribble of inspiration. Hmm. Well, uh, you've worked with so many composers that are living composers. You've collaborated with them, done premieres. Any that come to mind, uh, I didn't, you know, there's a long list, but any that come to mind that you kind of had, uh, you were involved in the compositional process in some ways. I've had guests on who've said, you know, I, I worked with this composer and they brought the music in. I looked at it. I suggested certain things. Any of those collaborations that come to mind? No. No. Huh. Okay. My, most of my experience with composers is that I, I learn their music and, mm -hmm. you know, given the opportunity, I will play it for them. I love working with, I mean, I love working with composers, but I'm also, um, you know, it's funny, it's partly because of, because of Lowell, who, who really, I think, has a very strong belief in the quality of his own work and his understanding of what, he, what it is he's written. So he doesn't feel the need to have that the kind of collaboration that would involve revisions yeah. coming from a performer um and i trust him so that's okay yeah you know because in fact his music doesn't need that it mm -hmm. it's extraordinarily polished and extraordinarily well constructed and, and written for the instruments that he's writing for mm -hmm. because he studies he, he's very careful about that mm -hmm. um, i have certainly had experiences with composers some of whom are quite famous and won't be named where that kind of polish isn't the case and where you get scores or parts that actually don't make sense. Uh, I'm sure you've probably had that experience too. So um, I, I put a lot of value in a composer, not only writing great music, but knowing their craft to the extent that they can notate it. Mm. I think that's a really important skill. Um, but I, I don't feel comfortable going to a composer and saying, hey, you know what you notated here, that's BS, can't do it. Um, or it doesn't make sense, right? You don't do that. Um, 
Let's see. So I, I, I'm saying all of that. And Lowell is the composer who I've collaborated the most with, and I really feel very comfortable with his idiom, mm. with his music. So he's kind of the one I, the touchstone I would go back to on that. Another question, and uh, people who listen to this know that this is coming because I've done over 130 episodes, probably 100 of them had this question. It's a life-changing moment, personal or professional or both? Well, there's certainly, I mean, in terms of my development as uh, an artist and as a musician, I actually, I need to shout out another person who's no longer with us, who was one of the biggest influences on me um, when I was in my early 20s, I guess, the late teens, early 20s. And that was Harvey Shapiro, who was a cello professor at Juilliard. And I first met Harvey through my uh, first college roommate um, and ended up going out to the summer program where Harvey taught and working as the kind of unpaid accompanist for his cello studio. I was always a great sight reader. I could learn, I mean, with Harvey, you only need to know the first 12 bars of every piece anyway, so that was no problem. Um, but from watching the way he, th the, from, from listening to the way he taught, the way he thought about sound, um, the way he technique, um, I found so many ideas about his approach to playing the cello that actually translate to playing the piano. Mm. Um, things about how you use your body, how, I mean, a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, now it would just be, now we would talk about it as being good use. But in those days, nobody talked about that. You know, it was, it was Russian school or it was whatever. But that was, it was fascinating to me to watch a musician who could, without looking at the person who was playing, tell them exactly what they were doing wrong. And that's something that I've learned to do on the piano as well, usually. I mean, especially with in-person lessons, if I can usually tell by the sound what the physical problem is. And I, I, think that's a, I think that's a really important thing, not necessarily because it's good for the students, but because it means that I actually, I can use that in my own understanding. One of the things that Harvey always used to say is, I don't need to practice. I just need to listen to you guys, you know, basically. <laughs> and it was a little cruel. Um, and I don't really think it's true, but I think there is, we learn a lot from our students and I, I look at it in a much more positive way. Mm. Um, so that, so that was definitely a life changing moment for him, for me was meeting him and having the opportunity to spend so many hours in his studio over a period of several years. Um, I spent much more time with him than any of his students did. Well, you mentioned the Russian school. Is there still such an idea of the Russian school, this school, that school? Uh, do you still feel that? Does that still exist? Because uh, for me, those concepts feel, uh, you know, Soviet uh, era concepts. I was born in Soviet Armenia as the Soviet Union was collapsing, but my grandmother was a piano teacher, music theory teacher, music history uh, teacher. And, and I, I feel some of those ideas are very Soviet time. So 30, 40 years ago, people thought of music that way. Is, does that still exist now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it does. Okay. And it's, fasc it's fascinating to me because it's here in the U.S. And it's funny because it's not what I, it's not what I learned at all, but I, I see students who learn that way. Mm -hmm. Wow. Switching gears a little bit, we talked so much about music. Tell me something that your followers, your friends, colleagues might not even know about you, but you have the secret hobby or any hobby, something that you do that's not musical. I know you're busy with music, but is there something that's not musical? Absolutely. No, I, I, um, I absolutely love the fact that I get to live in Colorado because I can escape to the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, my escapes to the mountains might involve climbing peaks with my son or by myself. Um, or what I did a couple weeks, well, I guess it was only a week ago that I went out and did, you know, a 26-mile trail run over a couple of passes. So I do crazy stuff out in the mountains. But there's, there's so much just it's just glorious to be out there. It's glorious to, to see that, to be part of it. You know, I'm, I'm not a religious person, but it may, maybe that's by religion. I don't know. Um, it's something that I feel I can, that, that, that restores my spirit and uh, provides a real, real sense of, of being in a, being in, 
being in a wonderful world, actually, which is, a, you know, I'm, a, I'm an incurable optimist, although I'm finding myself sorely tried these days. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's refreshing to be able to go out and just see that. Yeah. And being in it, and being, and there's other people out there enjoying it too. You know, you don't have to see them up close, but that's a that's a nice kind of a nice kind of community without a community, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. So, so that's probably that would be my my number one thing. So, mm -hmm. a couple more questions. One is, as a pianist, a pianist probably have the most competitions out of any instruments. Uh, what are your thoughts on the competition? You know, I've had so many friends that have felt discouraged over the years. You know, I've had friends who've done so well in competitions but then i've had friends who've come back and said hey i, I kind of just want to take this big break and i'm so devastated and hurt and just don't want to do this and it really broke me i prepared so well and then i went and i you know i thought i did well but i didn't do well uh, your thoughts on the competition and maybe some kind of advice to young musicians going through this competition process right well you know the older i get the more i feel that Earl Wilde was right, and that competitions have no place in our world. Um, the irony, of course, is that he did sit on competition juries, but there you go. Um, he never won, he never, I think, I don't even know if he entered any competitions, but he certainly never won any of the big ones. Um, you know, for somebody of a generation where all successful American pianists won either or both the Naumberg and the Leventritt. I mean, that was, that was the thing, right? Um, to have a teacher who hadn't was interesting, especially somebody of that stature. I think, you know, and, it's, and I have younger students and I think they're the competitions, the, the sort of little local competitions are valuable for um, building repertoire, for building resiliency in performance, which is a big deal. But the process itself um, especially when you get to the big international competitions, is pretty anti-musical. Um, and I entered my share and I have a couple prizes, but, you know, I can't say I ever enjoyed that experience. I enjoyed preparing for them. That was, it's a pleasure to learn repertoire and to have a goal. Um, but the competition itself, eh, not so much. Um, and I, I, I feel like, Especially today, it's less and less relevant because there are so, there, it was always, I mean, it's been true for my entire lifetime, but the, the business has changed so much. There are so few big careers to be had, right? And some of them do go to people who win prizes and competitions, but not all of them. Some of those big careers happen to somebody like Simona Dinnerstein, you know, who was discovered in a way. Um, you know, so there are other ways to get that career. Mm -hmm. But my real advice is that this is a world, and, and, and I'm saying this, it's a little projection because this is not necessarily what I'm good at. This is a world in which the successful musician is the one who is entrepreneurial, the one who makes things happen. Mm -hmm. And I wish I'd known that when I was in my 20s. And I do feel like a lot of the musicians I work with, especially out here at the University of Colorado, do know this. They do understand that if they're going to stay in this business, and not all of them will, but if they're going to stay in this business, it's going to be what they make of it. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, you know, it's been democratized in a way, right? You can, you can access the world. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to reach the world. Yeah. But you can, you can post something that the world could potentially see. And that's a, that's a big change from when I was young. That didn't exist. Then that's that next step of, you know, how do you actually get the world to pay attention to it? That's still pretty darn, pretty darn difficult. Yeah. And my next question was going to be advice to musicians in general, you know, leaving, you know, getting out of college. Anything else you want to add to give advice to young musicians coming out of college? You already said it, but is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, you know, we... We do music because, because we love it, because it's something we really have to do. And if it turns out that you can't make it your profession, you still can do it. And if, it, if you do make it your profession, there's a hundred, there's hundreds of, of different ways that you can find so many paths. You know, I work with pianists. So for pianists, 
our bread and butter doing collaborative work with uh, working with others the most important thing you can do in a way um, and that can take so many different forms teaching because if you love this then part of what you want to do is you want to give that love to the next generation um, and i think it's a you know i believe i believe that what we do as musicians is essentially a giving of ourselves right it's a very generous thing to perform to share that with other people it's a very generous thing to teach to i mean and i don't mean it, i don't mean this to sound like a self-centered kind of a thing but rather that this is this is what we're about mm -hmm. we're about spreading spreading the good news if you will the power of this art that we that we practice that was well said thank you so much anything else you want to add anything about your upcoming projects anything you want to add before we end today um, yeah, I, in terms of upcoming projects, we're looking at more virtual recitals. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I am doing right now is exploring uh, music, piano music by black composers. Um, I have a program coming up uh, in a couple weeks that's going to be live streamed of music by, uh, let's see, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, uh, Nathaniel Dett, mm -hmm. uh, Florence Price, and Margaret Bonds. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really, it's, it's a wonderful bunch of music. Um, I think it'll be the kind of program that anybody would enjoy. Um, it's really all very uh, well-written and attractive stuff. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, you know, I actually don't know what's happening in the world of live performance right now. And it's a, it's a kind of a strange moment in that respect because who knows, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm keeping busy with the, with the virtual. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure and hope uh, I see you one day in person. I hope so too. That would be real life. Real life is better than Zoom. Of course. <laughs> thank but you so much. Be, it's great to meet you here. All right. Have a beautiful day. You too. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.